like to just share in a little bit as the field force on elders at the gate. Um, I know that uh, Pastor EC has already turned this topic to pieces, so what can you say after Pastor EC has preached on the topic? Mm -hmm. But I can hang on one leg on one side, so that's what I'm going to try and do. <laughs> We're going to try and use one leg and just hang on, like you know how boss conduct used to hang on the boss <laughs> from one side. So I can try to do that. And, Maybe by God's grace we can arrive at some measure. So please stay with me, Jude. Don't, don't leave. Don't, don't leave. Let's do it together. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. So God bless you. Let's put our hands to these technical guys. Put our hands together. God bless you, guys. Thank you. So uh, we're talking about elders at the gate. So we'll start tonight with the definition. An elder is people older than people who are older than one. That's an elder, right? Uh, school children were no less fascinated than their elders. So this is an example. This is like a, a web dictionary definition of elders. So people who are older, someone older than one is called an elder. And you know this is an example. And then uh, second definition of elders, a leader or senior figure in a tribe or any other group. And this is the second definition where we're, ta we're taking a look, a senior elder in the tribe. A person with a voice in a tribe is an elder at the gate. So, so this is actually a council of village elders. This is actually where we're leading towards the second definition of it. People, a, a, a leader or senior figure in a tribe. So when we say elders at the gate, so we're talking about a, 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 a platoon of the people who hold decision on behalf of an entity, on behalf of a tribe. The people who go ahead of the tribe in every group they are always leaders and you can call them elders so when we say gates what's a gate this is actually a gate right this is a Buja city gate so that's what a gate looks like the gates of a city so this represents the staff of authority of the city or what the city is about in every and if i show you 10 pictures of a, of every city you will you easily identify what the gates are for example, if I say, what's the city gate of London? What will you think? It's actually the image of the city that is the gate of the city. The real, so Abuja city gate actually should actually be the house of parliament in Abuja. Do you understand? So what, what for London what will it be? The Big Ben, right? If, if, if we say for the US, what will the city gate look like? The White House. Do you understand? So this it's so when we think or uh, maybe the house of the UK House of Parliament, for example. So let's read this together. One, two, go. Proverbs one twenty-one. When we shall calls aloud outside, she raises her voices in the open squares, she cries out in the chief concourses. At the opening of the gates is the city, she speaks her word. Where is wisdom speaking from? From the oh, gates yes. of the city, from the opening of the gates of the city, wisdom is speaking forth. Wisdom is speaking forth from the opening of the gates. So I want to stay around this definition just a little bit more. So when you hear a gate, maybe your temptation will be to think airport, like this is Heathrow, uh, or let's say when we go to Mutala Mohammed, and when we have like a real airport that we can actually look at and say this is Nigeria's gateway. Do you understand? When we do have that kind of airport, we can actually be taking a look at it. It's the city gate. But that was the that that's a new definition of gate. The old definition of gate was not that. The old definition of gate was more like and the biblical times it was just a doorway into the city where the prophets cried out the king's journey the people meet. So it was like a center of city life. So see, gate actually doesn't mean the access way in and out. Gate actually mean the theater of power. If you went to Berlin, in East Berlin, they they have a place called Alexanderplatz. In Alexanderplatz is where all the matches of the old Russian republics used to happen. And it, as you were, it was like the entrance between the, the East and the West. But it was also the center of, of power. The king's palace actually sat at the edge of the city gate. The temple also sits at very close to the city gate. Do you understand? All the things that are powerful in a town sits close to the gate. When Nehemiah came, 
he saw the gates and the gates were born and that the temple of the Lord has been desecrated. What does that mean? He put them back to back, which means that the city gate and the temple were not too far apart. So, so what the idea of the gate is the place where government and legislation happens, number one. Number two, it's like the royal promenade for parades and city life. Number three, social performance and the king's court are also at the city gate. Worship, sacrifice, and spiritual life is also done at the gate. And the business affairs and innovation. Remember, during the time of, Je of Solomon, when Solomon was king in Jerusalem, the Bible records that the gates of the city were not closed day and night. So they had, he also the first 24 hour business empire was a time of Solomon. So because people would travel from Arab, people would travel from, from Mesopotamia, people would travel from Asia, they would all come to do business with Solomon at the city gates. And at that time, the, the city gates were then left open. The business empire was not closed day and night. Day and night. That's exactly what it means. Do you guys get this? So. Therefore, when we hear the idea of the city gate, we should stop thinking about the type of gate which Solomon, which Samson took from uh, who? From the Philistines. He took the city, he took their gate, and went and put it on top of the city. It was a metal gate. So that we should stop thinking about the old Benin Empire, the gate that allowed it in and out. We should stop thinking about it. So the gate is actually the center of city life. So tonight, we're going to just take a look at three people at the gate. Uh, Jehoram, servant, the sons at the gate, and uh, two kings at the gate. So, uh, in one case, there was a doubter at the gate, and someone who was lost in for control, actually. He marked himself at the gate. The second one, the Bible talks about the sons at the gate. So let's go into it, first of all. Second Kings chapter 7, verse 1 to 2. Let's read it together. Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, the seer of fine flour will sell for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leading said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? Elisha was replying, saying, You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. This was the story of the four lepers at the gates. These four lepers sat at, at the place where everybody was passing, and then they will beg all day, beg all night. Do you understand? And then at that time, Jehoram was the king of Israel. And there was a lot of trouble and hunger, pandemonium. And they called Elisha and said, Elisha, come and prophesy. And Elisha said, by this time tomorrow, look at it, by this time tomorrow, a seer of the finest flower will sell for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate. So flour and barley, yeah, will be selling for like nothing. It's like saying, uh, a mudu of what? what? Yes, a mudu of gari, yeah. Will sell for 10 naira or something like that. Do you understand? One naira, 50 cup or something like that by tomorrow. And then everybody will look at like, then there's a particular guy who, who had become rich by hanging with the king. You know all those doubters on social media, whenever you're saying anything about what God is going to do, they always challenge you like, what you're, what you're saying is not real. Can it be real? You know, and the Bible records that this particular guy was a man of privilege, of course, and the king leans. I mean, there's something that happens to you when the king leans on your hand. You feel like you're close to power. You feel like you, you know they really know everything that's happening. It's not possible. You have a sense of knowing. And something that happens to this kind of people is the fact that just watch out when you're close to power. Watch out when you're close to power. Watch out that you don't become a dog close to power. People who are close to power always end up like dogs of Jezebel. Every time Jezebel kills someone, those dogs will be down that will lick the cops. Do you understand? People who are close to kings don't know that somehow one of the things they do is that. And they speak from that grandiosity as if they are the king. 
And how many of you know about the, the courts of power? Right now, I think we should all be learning about what? The courts of power. How many of you have heard about the cabal? Yeah. <laughs> the cabal around power. Those are the kind of people who say these kind of things. Those people who sit around the president. They're not the president, they're not the vibes, but they control everything. Chief of protocol, the king leans on him. May we never be those kind of people who, when the move of God is coming, all we can see is how it cannot happen. And may we never be elders at the gate who don't realize our role at the gate is powerful. May we never be people at the gate who sit at the gate without vision, without knowledge of what God is about to do. May we never be at the gate and what eats our heart is our self. Because what is eating that man is his self-importance. And just to have power for the sake of power. Some people don't know what power is about. When you sit at the gate, one of the things that you must have in mind is what is the use of power? Do you know sometimes God is the one holding back power from some of his children because they just cannot adjudicate power correctly. Do you know in my time in leadership, I've learned so much. In leading people groups and leading teams, I've learned so much. Do you know at some point in time, I nearly lost myself as a leader. I nearly lost myself as a leader. How did that happen? Number one, power gets into your head. <coughs> power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Once everybody steps back and you have the word, all of a sudden you now begin to feel like you are better than everyone else. So, if you lead, leadership should confer a huge amount of humility on you. Humility. Lead with humility. And Jesus was the model of leadership for all of us to see. He was clearly a leader at the gate. And how did he express his leadership? Because something about lead elders at the gate may tell us, like, what we're thinking about is actually about how we can be the, the big boys of the gate. <laughs> do, do you guys understand? So when a topic like this comes, you may think, like, what God is trying to say is actually about us rising up to the occasion of sitting at the gate on a big chair. In fact, some of us have already imagined the, the minarets and the gold trimmings on the chair we're going to sit on. Once God told me, I didn't love the, the, my, my pastors, so I sent them a congregation to build their office. I love my sheep, so I sent them a servant to serve them. The pastor is the servant of the people. The pastor is to serve the people the purposes of God. The pastor is to administer the people what God wants in their lives. The pastor is to stand with the people and labor with the people. My Paul says, my little children of whom I travel until Christ be formed in you. Until Christ is formed in you, it is not enough. Until Christ be stirred up in you, it is not enough. Until Christ until people who can't pray begin to find their voice. Until people who can't hold on to God begin to hold on to God. Until people who don't know God begin to break into light. Your eldership is trite. It's little. Mm. Let it be that any one of us who carries eldership, carries it with the grace and the capacity of God. Not like this man who sat at the king, ate big meat in the time of famine. A big fish. What else do you think they were eating at that time? <laughs> grapes. Uh, yeah, we used to see grapes and cheese in the movies. And now they used to put uh, their hand inside the inside the roast roast. Uh, this and pluck out the leg. After eating fat. He stands against the prophet of God. After eating big, he doesn't think like everybody in the land deserves the same thing he's getting. He sits as a gatekeeper, as a gate stopper. 
may we never be like that. Yeah. And I hope that every one of you can repent tonight and say, God, may I never be a gate stopper in the kingdom. May I never be that man who stops other people from entering in. And after you brought me in, what I want to do is to sit and block other people. May I never be that man. May I never be the reason why some people fall short of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. That's the first person we'll deal with tonight. Second, sons at the gate. This may not be elders yet because there is actually something recently called the L word, the leadership word, where people actually just take leadership for the sake of leadership. And it is increasingly being taught that leadership is no more about a title. Leadership now is a function. Leadership is no more a title. Leadership is a function. So anyone who can stand to take people in, anyone who can serve, do you understand? You can actually get your bosses to do what you want them to do. You can actually lead from the bottom. You can lead your bosses. You can get them to do what they don't want to do. Do you guys understand this? This is actually about sonship. This leadership is about what? Sonship. There's another kind of eldership at the gate that is about being a son. Do you know, if you are a son in the company business, when you come, how do the people in the business treat you? They treat you like one of the benefactors of the business is here. They can't quite attach a title to you, especially if you are not a director in the business. But when you arrive, what happens? Everybody begins to pay attention that a co-owner of the business is around. Why? Say sonship. Sonship. So let's read the scripture. Like arrows, one to go. You guys are not alive. <laughs> okay, can you come alive? Let's read this one to go. Like arrows in the hand of the warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed and happy and fortunate is the man whose spirit is filled with them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gathering of the city gate. They will not be afraid when they stand up to speak at the city gate. A man who is full of sons, a man who is full of sonship, a man who has kids everywhere will not be ashamed when it's time to talk in the gatherings, when it's time to talk in government, when it's time to lift up their voice, when it's time to declare anybody who has people who the spirit of sonship is inside of them will not be ashamed at the gates. There is a position of speaking from sonship. Who are you? Once you know who you are, eldership at the gate, it now belongs to you. Because sometimes when we say elders at the gates, there's another misconception we may have. You need to be like this big tutu, walking on a walking stick. You understand? Some of you have seen you know, there's an elders council where Richard Brown sang this one tutu, and you know, these people are now old. But some of us who are a little old don't think like they are so old because if you understand, we're not too far away from them. You don't know, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> but when you talk to the 14 year olds now, you now know that these people are actually really old. Like, for the 14 year old, let's, let's ask Moody now, like, yeah. Did you tell Moody about uh Moody have you ever heard of Babangila? Babangila. <laughs> tell him. Are you serious? If you tell him Babangila, you ask him, is it our ancestor? <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you guys understand that another generation has already arrived? Do you, do you get Another generation has arrived. So we don't feel like we are son enough because we're waiting to become like this Montutu. Before we can be elders at the gate. You are now an elder. Stephanie, elder Stephanie. Do you understand? When you see 16 year olds, you now know that you are now an elder. 
Do you guys understand what the point I'm trying to make? Because we're waiting for some elders at the city gate who are going to come with white, white beard. Do you guys get this? The sons of the man are the elders of the man. The ones with the spirit of sonship are the elders. The one where they act with the mind of discernment are the elders. Mm. The one who will act on behalf of the family are the elders. Mm. So let's let's not even preach about the elders at the city gate. Let's define who is the elder at the city gate. Say, I am. I am. That's where I was going. For you to identify yourself as elder at the city gate. Of course. There are more elderly elders, and we should pay them respect for their elderliness. <laughs> You'll be unwise if you meet a 60-year-old elder and you are matching eldership with your own eldership. Your two, your sergeant rank with his uh, four-star eldership. But don't forget that the best organizations are the organizations where everybody can act from the most junior to the most senior. Everybody acts within the confidence of their power. If, every, if in any organization you go that everybody has to wait for the CEO to act, just know that that organization cannot go wrong. Do you understand? Everybody must be able to act. Of course, there will be the draw of where everybody's power reaches, but everybody must be able to act. Go to a supermarket where there are four salesmen, but nobody knows the price of anything, and they didn't write the price. And have you ever seen that kind of supermarket? Yes. And you carry something and you say, How much is this thing? The, the guy carries and runs the particular person and <laughs> asks, How much is it? How much do you think they can sell? After all, well, that person becomes like a, a bottleneck. Do you guys understand? Yes. Elders, elders, sons as elders, daughters as elders, elders of the grace of God, carriers of God for God nature. Do you know, sometimes we always keep praying to arrive. We don't know that we're already arrived since. Yes. We don't feel like we have it all together. We don't feel like we're there yet. God wants to save us from that spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you never be one who always learn and never arrive at the destination of God. So eldership, therefore, is not about age only. It's sonship. Okay, so this is the second type of elders. Let's, let's take the third one and the final one. I'm going to finish in time, but this one has a long read. Um, oh, I didn't put the scriptures here. I was reading it so much, I didn't put it in my PowerPoint, but I have to get it for you. His first kings. Let me get it. In the shy and humbly, Christian, ever humbly, but I know she. Ning was had a holy and very honest diamond. She got a holy carbon in the year to say an humble She
years passed without war between Syria and Israel. Then it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. This same story you read in 2 Chronicles 3 is the king of Israel this time was Ahab. The king of Israel said to his servants, do you know that Ramoth in Gilead is ours? So we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria. So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead. Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire of the word of the Lord today. You understand? Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 of them. And where do you think this meeting happened? At the gate. There's a meeting at the gate. It was a theater of power. The king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 of them, and said to them, Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So he said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into your hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, is there, still, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Bring me, bring Melchiah, son of Emla, quickly. 
the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at the threshing floor at the entrance of the. Uh, you guys are not following. I thought I was doing good. <laughs> <laughs> and all the prophets prophesied before them at the threshing floor at the entrance of the city gate of Samaria and all the prophets prophesied before them now Zedekiah the son of Chenana had made himself horns of iron for himself and he said thus says the Lord with these horns you will go the Syrians until they are destroyed and all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. Then the messenger who had gone to, to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, now listen, prophet. Listen. The words of the prophets are all with one accord. Encourage the king. Please, let your word be like the words of all the other prophets and speak encouragement mm -hmm. Milkaya said as the Lord lives whatever the Lord says to me that I will speak then he came to the king and the king asked him Milkaya shall we go to war against Ramot Kilian or shall we refrain and he answered go and prosper for the Lord will deliver it to the hand of the king so the king said to him how many times shall I make you swear that you will tell me nothing <laughs> but the truth in the name of the Lord. Are you guys hearing this story yes. very well? <laughs> and he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep without shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Je Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he will not <laughs> prophesy could concern him even evil. But Milkiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by on the right and on the left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that we may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit stepped forward and said, Before the Lord, I will persuade him. The Lord asked, said to him, in what way? He said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall. This thing, this thing, this plan you have is going to work. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord was putting a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your 400 prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chenata, went near and struck Micaiah in the cheek and said, which way did the Spirit of God look at me and bypass me and come to speak to you? <laughs> and Melchior said, indeed, you shall see on the day that you enter into the inner court, into the inner chamber. And when you go and hide yourself, you will hear from God. You will hear from God. So the king of Israel said, take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, God says the Lord, put this fellow in prison, and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in peace. But Melchiah shouted out, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. I said, Take heed, all of you soldiers who are going. This is absolutely wild. Absolutely wild. They sat at the city gate, two kings, they each sat on their throne. And they said to Jehoshaphat, a very important king, a man who had been appointed by Elijah as, a, as, a, as the king over Judah. And he came to meet the northern states. What was, Eli what was Je a man such as Jehoshaphat even do with a man such as Ahab? That's the first mismatch. In eldership, one of the things you have to discover is that oh, you cannot subject your eldership to all types of elders. Mm. They sat in a mismatch. That's the first thing. And then what do you say? I am as you are. Your people as my people. Your horses as... What should I say is, 
I am not to fear God for it from me. I'm not going to war with you. I am not as you are. Your horses are not my horses. My people are not your people. You want to go and fight over Ramon Gilead? Take, make, go and have fun. I came to pay courtesy call on you. I didn't come here to start a war with you. He had such a check. Jehoshaphat has a check in his spirit. I said, okay, but let's get a prophet. He wanted to pin. He was a politically correct man who wanted to pin it on someone else. So they first got up 400 prophets. When it, like, how long did this jamboree take? A prophetic jamboree. When all of them came and said, Thus says the Lord, go! Another one comes, Thus says the Lord, go! Thus says the Lord, go! And then the one that had drama was this uh, Chenanna. This guy, son of Chenanna. He came with horns. He's there! He's there! He came with iron horns. He came from himself with horns. He says, O oh king, put the horn on his head. So, O oh king, with this horns, you go the Arabians, this Syrian, you go them. He was demonstrating the whole drama, theater full of drama at the city gate. Drama. Drama. And then they said, Jehoshaphat still wasn't convinced. He said, Is there not a prophet of God? Every, after 400, everybody has spoken. Somebody said, The Spirit say, You go, you die. You go on this trip, you die. You go on this trip, you perish. You go on this trip, this is the end of you. Some things, he had the word of God inside of him. He wanted validation from the outside. Do you know sometimes the word of God inside of you is enough? Yeah. The word of God that boils on your inside is enough. Say it's enough. The word of God flowing out of me is enough. It's the intuition, the, the speaking of the Holy Spirit is enough. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. And this guy did not accept it. He says, he's in this. the king said, there's a prophet that I hate him. I hate him. He doesn't prophesy anything good for setting me. And this prophet came, Melchiah. And they told him, Melchiah, speak. He came. And then they advised him. Well, you hear this? Did you read this story? They advised him as he was coming and said, Melchiah, you know, you know, your dad used to make you prophesy all, all, all the time. You prophesy. Your prophecy doesn't used to. Everybody, 400 are prophesied before you come. Don't come and set yourself apart. He came and said, Long live the king, the Lord go with you. And the king, and the king said to him, Jehoshaphat said to him again, How long will I ask you don't like this? He knew there was a prophet. He knew, he knew. Because Jehoshaphat, do you know in this story, Jehoshaphat was sure. Yeah. He was sure that this yeah. thing was not supposed to be. Right. Doing. And do you know he still went to this war? <laughs> How many times when God is speaking to us, are we as obstinate as this Jehoshaphat guy? He nearly died. It's Chenanna. <laughs> Did not find it funny that Milkiah gave this prophet. He came and gave him a dirty slap. Wow. Where was I? That the Holy Spirit left me to come and use you. And he says, the guy answered him and said, The day you go, you know, there are some prophets who never enter the secret place. There are words all over the place. There are prophetic repetition words. Yeah. This prophet has come and said, This prophet has come and said, The quoting prophets left, right, and center. Right. What did God say to you? Mm -hmm. Putting this man of God, putting that woman of God, what did God say to you? God have concubines that give birth to have illegitimate children? Are we not all the sons of God? What did God say to you? He says, as an elder, you will know the secret of God when you go into the secret place. 
the secrets of God are not found out on the streets, they're not found on Instagram, they're not found yes. on a nice quote, they're not found on a nice, nice to have label, they're not found on the words of people. You will know the secrets of God as an elder when you enter into the secret place. In the secret place, some of you need to shut out the voice of many people and go to harvest the voice of God. Anyone who goes into the secret place finds this voice, finds this speaking of God. And that, that you have to cry and say, I need you. Oh, I need you. It's a place where many people do not venture into. There is a journey many people do not enter into. It is the journey of the accuracy of the Spirit. And this place is only found by a few. Those who are desperately in desire. And Milk Hire said it. You will know the day you enter into the secret place. You will know. You will know. God is not a respecter of presence. God wants to give you his presence, his heart, his everything. You cannot use your mind to uncover what God is saying. You cannot plot the journey of God in you. You cannot plot the direction of God's grace inside your life. For you to sit at the city gate, one of the things you need is accuracy of discernment. Amen. The story goes that the Melchiah finished the prophecy and the king said, take him away. As they were taking him away, he screamed those last words. If you come back, Ahab, if you come back, Jehoshaphat, then the Lord has not spoken to true me and all of you going to war with them. Take note, I said it. And they arrested him and put him in prison. And they went to war. Do you know what this king did when they arrived in war? You can read the story, the remaining part of the story. He took his armor, he took his kingly clothes and put on Jehoshaphat. He took his armor and put on Jehoshaphat. Then they started, they, 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 people said, don't fight anyone who are looking for Jehoshaphat, who are looking for Ahab. They told them they put some hundred elite squad warriors say no fighting, just pick up Ahab. Mm. At the city gates, the wisdom of God will be known. The wisdom of God will be known among the elders who go deeper into God. Hallelujah. In the in the end. Ahab did not return from that war. He was shot through by an arrow of a woman. And in Israel, that's actually a disgrace. Like a non-militant just killed a soldier. And Ahab, a Je Jehoshaphat barely came back on life. You almost say good for you. At least you knew you were supposed to be here. What is it? What is it about about prominence that tempts people? What is it about alliances that, that does people in? That you want that partnership by all means, and even though the person is not aligned with you, but you have to do that partnership. You know that partnership is eating your spirit, but you want to do it. You know that partnership is, is set for your destruction, but you want to do it. Every time you go into that partnership, it's taking you down. Everything in your spirit is crying out, no, no. What is it about alliances and the things that we want so bad? And money and relationships and the things that are so bad for us. I cannot tell you the number of people that I have talked to and all they say to me is, I know this, I know this relationship is bad for me, but I can't leave. I can't leave. I can't leave. So that means I wasted four years of my life. 
You know what they mean? They've done everything in their relationship. They've cooked. They've washed. They, they paid their money for the person to go to school. Wow. They're giving sex. It's all done. Do you understand? So you feel like, will I just allow the nigger to go free? <laughs> Do you guys understand? And even though this person is bad for you, every time you go, your, your prayer life dries up. Every time you go, you know the Holy Spirit out of you is literally caving in. But you feel like you must. You feel like you must. To be an elder at the gate is to know that the only need you have is the need of God. Do you know, if God comes, what God wants is for us to sit, to adjudicate his empire and his realm. God wants us to heal. God wants us to save. God wants us to deliver. Do you know, anytime we are going on this journey, all we're trying to do is to preserve ourselves. So we will look good to everybody. So we will be like everybody else. So we will be like other nations. Our objective is just to protect ourselves. So we will look married. So we will look like, you know, we have this relationship. So we will look like we have it all together. And our desires, our corrupting desires, inhibit our eldership. Because we're never able to rise up in God to be the man God wants us to be. We're never able to rise up in, rise up in God to, to, to clinch the purpose of God in our hearts. We're never able to journey all the way. And even though we're so near to it, we're now struggling that last lap. Because guess what? What God has in mind is that from now you will go and be a deliverer. Do you know we already know? You already know the truth. You already have the life of God. You already know how to pray. But God has refused to refuel you because why do you need more fuel when your tank is still full? Where is this elder going today? What is this elder doing today? The city gate is a center for innovation. It's the center for life. It's a center for causing people to come back to life. As you begin to do, God will give you more power. As you begin to do, God will give you more power. As you begin to go, God will give you more power. As you open more prison doors, God will give you more power. As you take up more hurting people, God will give you more power. As you reach out more, God will give you more power. Our job is to go, 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 go. Elders are not designed to sit. Because when you hear the word elders, you think people are sitting with wise words. No, these elders are to go to the city gate. So it's time for you to preach to someone. Tap someone next to you and say, it's time for me. You say, my brother, listen to me. Oh, you guys are talking in Spanish. I'm so surprised that you guys don't talk. And my sister, listen to me. You have no way to preach to. Leave your seat and go and look for somebody to preach to. Say, my sister, listen to me. My sister, listen to me. Don't listen to Chenanda. <laughs> Don't listen to Chenna now, please. Okay, we haven't finished preaching. Continue. My brother, my sister, listen to me. God is sending you on his own errand. Don't listen to Chenna now. Go and be a deliverer. Go and innovate. Salvation. Business. Idea. At the city gate. Go and build new systems. Go and save new men. Go and rescue the broken. At the city gate. God's heart is deliverance. Deliverance of the broken. God's heart is healing for the hurting. God is actually shutting down churches now. And God is telling us, focus on the outside. God has told me, I'm only sending you people. I'm actually happy with anyone who wants to go and leave the church. I'm telling them, go. go. God told me, you are a center. You're not a church. You're a center. Center to release. Release people. Anyone who comes and meets me and says, I want to go and say, oh, praise to God, where are you going? If it's actually a mission that you're going to, please go. If you're going to start something, go. Build something. That whole era of holding on to people, is over. 
God is actually focused on elders at the city gate, releasing the blessing, saving the broken, releasing the hurt, taking children, taking institutions, putting them back together. God is focused on you doing something with your life. God is focused on building. God is focused on the hurting in the city. God is focused on the broken people. God is focused. Do you know, every time you go out and do out, the next time you go to that same place, the place becomes turned around. We used to do outreach at... Uh, at uh, this, as you turn off to go to Pastor E.C.'s house, that place by the left, that Tipa Park, yeah. we used to do outreach. That place has now been taken over. We did only two outreaches there. By the time time we came, there were no more there. Do you understand? Because uh, your outreach, your outreach sends a message to that place. God wants us to be deliverers of the land. God wants to take more territories. God wants us to go out. God wants you to take what you know and go to the city gate. So eldership is not about sitting down because when we say elders at the gate, you know the imagination we have is actually some people sitting pretty and having wise words to tell other people. No, it's about going to the gate. It's about going to the city. It's about bringing deliverance and bringing the life of God out. And God wants you not to be an equality. To realize sonship. And number three, never to be that man who doubted at the city gate. Because life happens every day at the city. And only those who have the wisdom of God are able to unpack the grace of God in the city center. God is calling you tonight to walk with Him, to partner with Him in the city, to build life, to raise another generation to build something fresh and to become his mouthpiece in all the cities of the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Bless you. Worship. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.